Now you might be wondering what I'm doing here today, and I'm making my first attempt at chainsaw milling. So you might be wondering what chainsaw milling is, and what it has to do with meditation. Well, it doesn't have anything directly to do with meditation, but as you know, then I've been trying to build this eco-friendly meditation retreat. And part of that is to try to use the resources that naturally exist here on the land. And so there's many trees like this that have just fallen down in the forest. This is a quite a sound Douglas fir. It's very good construction wood. So by chainsaw milling, what I can do is I can turn this into good construction timber for building meditation huts and building a temple and that sort of thing. And it's ecologically friendly because I don't have to bring anything in from outside. And not only that, I don't have to bring in things that have been manufactured, treated, made in factories. There's the carbon footprint of actually bringing the stuff here. And also the expense, because in the long run, then I need this retreat to be more or less self-sufficient, right? So basically, if you're only interested in meditation instructions, then you can skip this video. But if I go over the process, then this might be something that's useful or interesting to people who are themselves want to learn how to chainsaw mill. I have to say, I've never done it before. This is my first time. And so I'm going to go through the process. And the first thing I'm going to do is use this draw knife and take off the outer bark on this Douglas fir. Now, you don't have to take the outer bark off, but the bark itself will dull the chain. So it means I'll have to sharpen the chain more often. And if I clean it up, if I can pull this bark off, what it means is uh, that the chain will last longer. And also I'll be able to make a nice line on that. So the first thing I need to do is get rid of this bark, and then I'm gonna mark up the uh, tree and make my first cut. Okay. I bought an Austrian dry knife online. It's called a Stubai. I think it's a good idea to buy that rather than a Chinese one. You need a tool you can get a sharp edge on. I mean, when I bought it, it was sharp, but not quite sharp enough. The sharper it is, the easier it'll be to peel the bark. Now I've cleaned off the tree about as best I could. I mean, you could scrub it with a brush, but now what I need to do is I need to mark it with a chalk line. I need to get a straight line all the way down the tree so that I can follow it with the chainsaw. Because what I'm gonna be doing is this chainsaw milling, but it's freehand, not using any device. Now often you will see these jigs or rigs that they use. They sell them commercially and you can make them yourself. And that allows the chainsaw to go very evenly along the log. But it's extra expenditure, and also it's a lot more work on the chainsaw. It uses more gasoline, and it wears the chainsaw out. Because basically you're cutting with the grain. And when you cut with the grain, then the chainsaw, the chain itself, gets clogged very easily. And then not only that, then it's harder to cut. You know when you cut across the grain, it's very easy, right, if you're cutting logs like this. But when you're going with the grain, then the saw struggles a lot. And if you can do it by hand, then you're able to cut it more or less across the grain by holding the chainsaw above it, and it's then vertically going down. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark uh, a point for this line to be fastened to this end of the log, and I'll go down to the other side and fasten it there. And generally, then, this is a lot easier with two people, right? but George has had to go in. He's taking my neighbor, Doug, you know, the one who had had the near-death experience. Well, he's going uh, to visit his sister, so he's got to catch a plane. So I'm on my own, but it's possible. On your own, it just takes longer. You just have to take your time. Now, in general, then the crown of the tree uh, is a bit smaller. As it gets taller and taller, it gets a bit smaller. But in with these uh, Douglas fir, then they're more or less straight. And on the bottom, I stopped before it got to where the roots are, where it starts to get wide. So the first thing I need to do is I need to measure to see how uh, wide this tree is, what the diameter is going horizontally across. And then I'm gonna take off two or three inches on the edge. And so the first thing I need to do 
is measure it and make a mark and then fasten this uh, chalk line to it. So here I can see at the widest part of this tree that it's 17 and a half inches more or less. And so what I want to do is I want to take the same amount off this side as that side. So first what I'll do is I'll measure it here, make a mark, and then I'll measure at the bottom. And if the bottom is a little bit wider, then I have to calculate or compensate for that. So let's say we'll take off three inches. I'm going to get rid of this outside part of the tree and take off three inches. So I'll make a mark, 14 and a half, right? Make a mark of 14 and a half. Now I was looking for a pencil. It's a funny thing about pencils because somehow they always disappear. I intentionally bought loads and loads of pencils, but it doesn't matter how many pencils I have, I always seem to lose them. So all I could find was this Sharpie, this marker. So I've made a mark at 14 and a half inches. And now I want to find the point vertically where that intersects the edge of the log. So I've got this uh, square and it's got a spirit level on it. And I can find out where it's vertical. And from there, the edge of the log is this point here. And I'll draw a horizontal line in as well. Because when I cut, I might use that as a guide to help me get started to make sure that I'm vertical. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off this edge of the log. It will be waste or it can be used for fencing or siding, something like that. Now, really, I don't need to be this accurate. I could probably get away with doing it all by hand, just with a roughly drawn line. But I'm learning. I'm a beginner. So I need to see how the process works. And also if I do it properly, or as properly as I can, then I can show you how it's done. So I want to make a little notch here in the tree where the string's going to catch. Especially since I'm doing it on my own. If I had somebody here to hold it for me, then we could line it up nicely. But I'm on my own, and so if there's a notch, then the string won't slip. And I'll know it's in the, in the right place. Often we throw away these plastic jars. They're a real nuisance because everything these days comes in plastic. I really don't like it, you know. Glass is much better for the environment. Even if you don't recycle the glass, then it can be smashed up. It can be used as aggregate even. But plastic just is the bane of the world. It takes hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years to break down. So if you can use them to store and sort nails and so that sort of thing, it's great. Okay. So hopefully this chalk line is gonna be able to make a nice mark on the tree. And so like this, if I snap the string vertically, it should be able to draw a nice line on that tree. And that means that I'll have something to follow. I've got to go down the other side and do the same thing. So as I said, generally the base of the tree has got a greater diameter than the crown. And I needed to measure it to see what the difference was between the two. And, but I didn't want to cut the tree at this point because if I had, Unless I prop it up, then the tree's going to collapse. So instead of doing that, what I've done is I've cut a slot into the tree so I can measure the diameter accurately. And it's not too bad. This side is 19 and 3 quarters, and the crown is 17 and a half. So it's only 2 inches and a quarter greater in diameter. So what I need to do is I need to take a little bit extra off on this side in order uh, to compensate. And so the difference is two and a quarter. That means it's one and an eighth. We have one and an eighth, two and a quarter divided by two, one and an eighth. So now I'm going to be doing four and an eighth inches uh, to get as much wood off this side as is off the other side. Again, it doesn't need to be completely accurate. It's just a rough cut. But it's good practicing doing these things properly. This is why pencils are much better. Not only are they better for the environment, but you can even write with a pencil underwater. Whereas a Sharpie is useless when it gets damp. Okay, now we need to stick 
a nail in here. If I can find a straight nail. So most of these are nails that I've recycled. that have been lying around the property. One thing you have to be very careful about is making sure that you remove all the nails once you're done. Otherwise, if you hit one with a chainsaw, not only might it dull your chainsaw, but uh, you might also break the chain, which is quite dangerous. Now we want to snap this line somewhere roughly in the middle, and it should be vertically, straight up from where the line needs to be. And as you can see there, and that's actually given us quite a clear line in order to cut to. You can also do this just using a bit of red string or something like that, but I don't like the idea of the string catching on the chainsaw. So when I started this venture, then I purchased an electric chainsaw. And that's partially for environmental reasons, or maybe you could say mainly for environmental reasons, but also so as not to disturb the neighbors so much, because they're a lot quieter. And of course they don't need to use gasoline or any sort of carbon fuels, and uh, you can charge them with the hydroelectric that's here. And so that's very environmentally friendly. But in order to do chainsaw milling, then I need something much more powerful than that. And so what I did in the end was I bought a brand new still 462 gas chainsaw. And it's a compromise, right? But um, that electric chainsaw, or most electric chainsaws, don't have sufficient power. And the recommendation is that you should get a 70cc or greater chainsaw. Now this 462 is a kind of modern chainsaw, means it's a lot lighter. So this weight to power ratio is much better. It's gonna be easier to use. Now I added something on that, and that is a spirit level. So I added a spirit level on top, and that's to help me cut these planks uh, in a vertical plane more easily. I'm not sure if it's going to work, I think it's going to vibrate a lot, so it's going to be quite hard. But I think once you get it going, uh, then it will kind of improve the situation a bit. Now there's an issue, because I only had experience with electric chainsaws. And if you see on the electric chainsaw, then there's the chain oiler that's at the front. And there's only one, because it uses a battery and doesn't use gasoline. And also, then the chain oiler is clear or kind of see-through, trans transparent plastic. And so when I got the still, and the first thing I saw was this transparent plastic filler. And so I put the oil in that. But unfortunately, this is for the gasoline. And the oiler is in the front here, and it's opaque. It's not see-through like this one is. So I, I confuse them, right? I'm not used to it. So that's a big mistake, and you can learn from my mistakes. Now what I've done is, I've emptied out the oil, obviously, and then I filled it with some gasoline and swished it around to clean it out. Got rid of that gasoline and I put some new gasoline. Of course it's oil and gas mix, 50 to 1. And now I'm going to try to start this for the first time because I've got to start it and I've got to calibrate it. So of course, first, when you start it, and you have the safety engaged. That means that the chain isn't going to spin. And on this model, then there is a decompression lever. And basically what that's in, it makes it a lot easier to get the first crank start. And what we have to do is we start it when it's cold, put the trigger in, and put it into the start position. That's where we'll start. Well, hopefully it'll go, I mean, I don't know. I filled it full of oil, so maybe maybe I'm going to be in trouble.
I think I made a mistake at first and that was trying to cut little by little as I worked my way down the log. In my opinion, then it's better for you to first cut all the way along the line. And that's because as you cut, it produces a lot of sawdust and will hide your chalk line. But if you make a little groove, then it'd be easier to see what you're doing. Now when I started, then I was a little bit off the vertical. I think that's lack of experience. But once you get that groove or the cut vertical in the tree, then it's very easy to follow it. My main problem was standing on the log and you tend to get a sword back. In future, I think it's worthwhile to put some scaffolding, so like a plank along the log and make it easier to cut. So the gas ran out and that's a good time to break for lunch. But I have a few conclusions to make so far. One, as I expected, then this sight glass on top of the saw is absolutely useless. And that's because as soon as the saw starts, it vibrates so much that you lose the bubble. And anyway, you can't be sitting there looking at this level glass when you're trying to cut. What I found was that if you find where the saw is vertical, where the bar of the saw is vertical, when your hand is placed on the grab bar, and you always have your hand in that position, then the saw naturally will hang vertically. And then all you have to do is allow the saw to do the work. If it's sharp, that is, if your blade is sharpened properly, it will cut vertically. But if it's dull on one side, if you've hit a stone, it'll curve. So that's really important. If you can find where the saw naturally hangs in your hand, and for me, it's between these two middle knuckles at this point in my hand, right in the middle of the fist. If that's placed on the grab bar in the middle, lined up with the middle marker on the safety bar, then it naturally hangs down. And actually the cut's not bad. Uh, also, the one thing I'm noticing is that standing in this position, and it's very easy to get a sore back, really need to have your back straight, but then uh, the bar starts getting too short when you start getting down further into the log. I tried standing on the side, really what you need is, you need a plank along the side of the tree that you can walk on as you go along. That would probably be the safest option. And in terms of safety, then there's some really important things. Uh, you should have ear defenders, and I've got two. I've got ones in my ears and I've got these ones. And you should have a screen. Because there's chips they can get in your eyes, but also if the chain snaps, then it could be quite dangerous. So something like this is important. And also then these trousers I've got, these red trousers, they're actually safety trousers. If you catch it with a chainsaw, the chainsaw will stop, it won't cut your leg. You have to wear gloves. And uh, probably I should have something on the top, but it's just too hot. In terms of cutting then, you want an easy swinging action. And again, you're letting the saw do the work for you. So I'm just a beginner, but that's what I heard. I noticed that the, uh, the Indian uh, lumberjacks who do this kind of work, then he holds the saw just on the handle like that. And I think that's, I was wondering why, and I think that's to protect his back. But really you shouldn't do that. Because if your hand is here on the back, you may be able to stand up straight, but that means if there's kickback and the saw jumps up, then this safety device won't work. So really you should have your hand on the grab bar at all times. But uh, whether there's a great danger in it kicking back, I'm not sure. Because when it's in the groove, then the saw is pulling away from you. It won't kick back. But there's always the chance uh, that it could catch something. I think it's highly unlikely. So I understand why the Indian, the guy from Nagaland, is doing it like this. Because then you can stand up straight and just let the saw do the work for you. That's really what you want. But I think I'd be much happier if there was some kind of safety device at the same time as doing that. In the end, you know... I might end up doing that myself, but I recommend you don't. In fact, don't do anything I'm doing, um, you know, because it's dangerous. These things are lethal. Also, I noticed that the guys from Nagaland, these Indian lumberjacks, and they do this work in flip-flops. They call them chapal or chapalis. They're just like <laughs> sandals, and I wouldn't recommend that. These boots have got shanks in them, steel shanks and steel toe caps. So if the saw comes and you cut your toe, it'll hit the toe cap. It's not gonna cut your toes off. So really you should have all the safety gear, protect your ears, you know, wear gloves, wear chaps, 
the chainsaw trousers and do whatever you can. And again, I'm not telling you to do anything. This is just demonstration purposes because I don't want to be responsible for anybody getting hurt. So I'm going to go for lunch and then after that, I'll try to do another couple of hours. So today's lunch is homemade vegan French Canadian pea soup, homemade baguette, new recipe, and homemade kombucha. And you might be wondering why I'm showing you this. And that's because eventually, when this is a meditation retreat, then I want it to be an ecologically friendly meditation retreat, maybe even a permaculture meditation retreat. And that means in order to stay in retreat and not have to go out shopping all the time, and you need to have simple foods that uh, sustain you and also provide you with enough satisfaction so you don't feel like breaking retreat to go shopping. And uh, as we know, split peas and they're dry and they last for years, right? If you put them in a proper container and also bags of flour last for years if they're dry. And so you can make bread as well. And then kombucha is something you can brew yourself anytime. So I'm just going to have my lunch and I'll see you again later. So as I said, I'm using a brand new Still 462 and on that I've got a thin 32 inch bar with a skip tooth chain. So the skip tooth chain is good for cross cutting. That's where you leave out every second tooth and it means that it doesn't get clogged so easily. I found it very effective. <laughs> Okay, so that's my first freehand uh, chainsaw milling experience. As I said, I've never done before, honestly. And uh, I think although the results aren't great, then as I said, it's my first time. And 100%, then the more I do it, uh, the more I'll improve, right? I get the feel for it. I have to say that once you've got the chainsaw going in the groove, uh, it's very easy to follow the perpendicular. So as long as when you start the uh, log, you've got that vertical line starting okay. And as I said before, you know where the chainsaw naturally hangs, so the bar is vertical, and then it's pretty easy. I have to say it's quite labor intensive. Part of that is because I'm out of shape. I'm an old man, but all things considered, I did manage to do that in a few hours. It's about 20 inches in diameter. It's actually thicker this way. So it's a substantial piece of wood. And also this is Douglas fir. And it's been here for a while. So Douglas fir is naturally very hard. And then the older it gets, the harder it gets. Still, I have to decide in the end, then uh, will this be sufficient? Or do I need to buy a portable sawmill? Now a portable sawmill is great. Um, and it'll do the job with a lot less effort and a lot quicker. But the thing is you've got to get this log onto a sawmill. So either you'd have to set it up out here somewhere or you need some kind of lifting equipment or to drag this tree out of the forest. But um, my feeling is to go kind of really low tech, kind of hillbilly style. My conclusion is it's definitely worth doing. Probably as I get into better shape, it'll be easier. And also as you go along, then you learn. Like at first I, I wasted a lot of gasoline, a lot of petrol. Um, but then I found that you don't actually need much speed on the throttle. You're only cutting with a few inches of teeth. And as long as that bar is vertical, it's very easy. 
So at one point I tried to lie the saw on top of the uh, log and let it run almost horizontal. And there's something called a beam cutter and it basically does that. The saw sits like this. But as soon as it went more to the horizontal, I could immediately feel how much more the saw had to work, how much more effort it was, because it was cutting with the grain, getting clogged. And as soon as you went into the vertical, up and down more or less, you know, not many degrees off vertical, then it would cut very fast and very easily. Also the bar bores down through the log very easily. So it just goes to show if you're at an angle like this, quite easy, and then when you're running along the grain, then immediately the, um, the sawdust becomes very fine and the cut is very difficult. But when you cut it upright, then you get much longer shavings and much easier cut. So I'm quite pleased with that. And this wood, of course, doesn't have to be wasted. That can be used for siding on a building, or it can be used for fencing. It's quite good for fencing. So I'm not going to do the rest because uh, it's late and it's going to get dark soon. And I'm not really, I don't really have to film it all either because it gives you a really good idea of what's required in order to do this sort of freehand chainsaw milling. So uh, thank you for bearing with me and uh, I'll see you later.